Hi, I'm Dr. Preston Perry, and I've been asked, what are IVF genetic testing pros and cons? Now, these are things that have to be individualized with your provider uh, because they are very specific to why you are getting IVF in the first place. However, there are a couple of quick things to think about. First, for cons, cost. If you don't have it covered by insurance, it can add several thousand in cost to do genetic testing. Second, it can actually decrease an embryo's chances. Now, the amount is for debate, but if you're taking a few cells from an embryo, it is a little less healthy than if it had never been touched in the first place. And so, again, many people argue that these effects are subtle, but other places are seeing actually no difference between tested and untested embryos, where that difference therefore is meaningful for the strain. So you want to talk with your provider as to whether or not they think you need uh, testing for things. So it doesn't improve the chances. The embryo is what it is and can slightly make it less healthy. The other thing that's really important as a con to think about is it can delay your time to fertility. Everyone wants to be pregnant yesterday, but if you are sending the embryo off for biopsy, the pelvis often has to cool down relative to doing a fresh transfer. So those are important cons. However, there's some meaningful pluses to doing testing on an embryo. One, in a lot of practices, we see a decrease in miscarriage rates. If you are putting back a chromosomally normal embryo, um, that is more likely to implant and attach than one that is known to be abnormal and never had a chance. So that's important. Second, you decrease the likelihood of unexpected uh, chromosomal abnormalities, and this can include things like Down syndrome. If there is an embryo that has Down syndrome, there are many couples who would want to know that before putting it back so as to prepare their expectations. Third thing is you can actually increase the speed for pregnancy when it comes to frozen embryo transfer. Now again, the delay if you have, were wanting a fresh transfer, you can't do that. But once you're getting to frozen embryo transfers, you are only putting back normal ones that will lower the time to pregnancy if your practice is seeing a higher rate of pregnancy with chromosomally normal embryos than, you know, unbiopsied embryos. The next that is really important, and I think one of the top reasons to get PGT is to improve the understanding for recurrent implantation failure. If people are pregnant quickly, they're really happy and life is good. But if they're not, it drives them crazy as to why. And the ability to actually look at the embryo and say, well, you've been putting back abnormal embryos, they never had a chance, that's very different from how you go about things if people had had normal embryos back and they didn't take. And this is one of the important reasons for recurrent implantation failure. And to take that off the table is a very important consideration. The next thing that's important for having PGT is for family planning. If you are 37 and you have a lot of embryos that are stored, it's really good to know whether or not they are all normal or they are all abnormal. The 37-year-old with a lot of normal embryos is saying, okay, I've got my family future under control, most likely, while the person who thought they had four embryos that were normal and they're all abnormal and didn't know it may come back several years later and all of a sudden there's a window of opportunity that's been missed. So that's something that's often reassuring or important to know on the front end. Another advantage, and this is for debate, is whether PGT decreases the risk for multiples. And remember, by the way, PGS is pre-implantation genetic screening. PGT is pre-implantation genetic testing. And they're often the same term, but really PGT is the more modern term and it distinguishes A from M. A is for aneuploidy, chromosomal abnormalities. PGT-M is to uh, identify a single gene that might be passed on. Obviously, if you're doing PGT-M, that is really to avoid a specific condition and is its whole own category relative to PGTA, which I've been emphasizing. Now for decreasing multiples, obviously if you only put one back, embryo back at a time, whether you tested it or not, that doesn't change the multiple risk. It's still roughly 1% for spontaneous identical twins. 
However, if you are saying you've put back embryos that are untested, there is a point where people just become exhausted and say, let's put back two because things haven't been taking. And if you put back two, there's a greater chance that both will take. So if you only are putting back one, PGT can't help um, with decreasing multiples. But if you see that your practice has a chance for just being exhausted and being more aggressive by putting back two at a time, putting back a single normal embryo could potentially decrease that risk for multiples. The other thing to think about is the costs in the long run. If you are going to transfer an embryo, let's say you put one back, you're pregnant, deliver, everyone's really happy, but you have five frozen, you or many people wouldn't abandon those five frozen embryos. And it's really important to know if you are putting back abnormal embryos in the future and paying for them, and they never had a chance of taking, by eliminating those that were abnormal, um, you've actually saved your costs in the long run for transfers that never had a chance. But of course, that's dependent ultimately on your practice's success rate when comparing unbiopsied to biopsied embryos. Um, there's a lot more to go into this. This is an hour-long discussion uh, in detail. But I'd say if you have questions on this, um, write us and we can post more. Uh, share this with people who want to uh, learn about it. And thank you for watching.